Oh, here we go. That's why I was in the wrong. There we go. Oh, you started recording it, Starla? Okay, cool. All right. Yeah. So I just want to say thank you to everybody for popping on here. Um, it's a really cool experience whenever we get to do these things because we always have different groups. The first time we did this, we had um, we had a bunch of coaches from the flagship campus, which was awesome. So now we have uh, three diverse people. We have Scott Forbes, um, who's going to go into some really diving deep into some supplementation. I got our newly crowned Orlando Magic nutrition expert, uh, Jacqueline Sclaver. And then um, we're also going to have uh, Chris uh, Swagger. Who, um, yeah. He's actually from the flagship campus. He's the athletic director. He's going to pop on and give us some strategies for recovery there. So um, I'll turn it over to Stefan so he can kind of give the introductions for everybody. And I can't wait to hear what you guys have to say because I like learning just like everybody else does. So it'll be really cool to kind of experience this from a different perspective. So go ahead, Stefan. Very good. So thank you guys uh, for letting us have here. Jeff is the UDC for all Kaiser. And then it's a challenge to put everybody together. So thank you, Jeff. And then uh, Professor German from uh, Orlando campus, our program director here. So it's a bunch of efforts that we do. And then Dr. Scott Forbes is an associate professor in the Department of Physical Education at Brandon University adjunct professor in the Faculty of Kinesiology and Health Studies, University of Regina, Canada. Dr. Forbes is a certified sport nutritionist through the International Society of Sports Nutrition, clinical exercise physiologist and high performance specialist through the Canadian Society for Exercise Physiology. Very important now, Dr. Forbes has published over 85 peer review manuscripts, five book chapters. He researches in many topics, but on top of creatine, protein, supplementation with a variety of populations, athletes, uh, adults, and etc. So we start with uh, Dr. Scott. It was a pleasure. I saw his presentation, similar presentation in Brazil with uh, Professor Tacito, our colleague as well from University of P UFPR in Brazil. So thank you, Scott. Go ahead. Awesome, thank you very much for the opportunity to present alongside so many uh, distinguished speakers. So I'm look, really looking forward to the other speakers as well, but I'm gonna share my screen here and share my slides. Perfect. So as mentioned, I'm from Canada and uh, we're happy that the weather's starting to get a little bit warmer. So hopefully similar to what uh, the weather is in Orlando. I wish I was in Florida, but uh, that's OK. I can be here virtually. So um, you can also follow me on Instagram as well. If you want to find more information about creatine or contact me, that's probably the best way to contact me. And I try to be quite responsive on Instagram. But anyways, I'm very excited today to be talking about creatine supplementation. It's well known to enhance resistance training adaptations to help you get bigger and stronger muscles. And it's traditionally used for bodybuilders, um, but we know that there's lots of other benefits to creatine supplementation from a health perspective. So I'm gonna talk about kind of both the performance and the health perspective of uh, creatine. So you might be asking yourself, what is creatine and where is it found? You might have heard that creatine is an anabolic steroid, which is completely untrue. So if you see that in social media, that is a false statement. Creatine is definitely not a steroid. It's actually made up of three amino acids and amino acids are the building blocks of protein. So anytime you consume protein, you're consuming amino acids. And creatine is derived of these three, arginine, glycine, and methionine. And your body can synthesize its own creatine, primarily in the liver and kidneys. It can put these three amino acids together, but we can also synthesize creatine in our brain. So every single human, every student that's listening to this presentation has creatine within their body. And uh, so, it's not, it's not a steroid, it's not a bad thing. Um, we're gonna find out more about creatine in this presentation. But you can also get creatine from food as well. So our bodies can make it, but we can also get it from food. And most of the studies ever published use a dose of about five grams per day. And uh, 
Um, I'm sure as we're going to hear in, in other presentations, obviously a, a food first approach for sport nutrition is, is really important. But most, as I mentioned, most studies use five grams of creatine per day. And to achieve this with food is actually very, very challenging and difficult. These are some of the, the foods with the highest concentrations of creatine. Things like beef, heron, salmon, etc. But you'd have to consume over three pounds of beef per day to get five grams of creatine each day. Or if you like fish, herring, you'd have to consume over a pound of herring every single day. I don't think that's feasible or two cups of, or 200 cups of milk or 2.5 pounds of salmon every single day. So it's very, very difficult to get creatine from food sources alone. And it's also important to note that every single randomized control trial ever published trying to increase creatine stores within the muscle to enhance performance has used a supplement. So I like to use science and evidence to inform my practice. And if we're using the science, it's important to understand that every single study that's used, that's looked at creatine to enhance performance has used a supplement. Maybe we need to do a, a dietary study. But we know that if you supplement with creatine, that you can fill your muscles or saturate your muscles with creatine. We also know that vegetarians or vegans actually have a lower amount of creatine within their muscles, and they tend to be more responsive to creatine supplementation. So if an individual is on a plant-based diet, creatine supplement seems to be even more important to them just because they have less creatine in their muscles to begin with. But both omnivores and vegetarians, you can give them 20 grams of creatine per day. Traditionally, it's split into four doses over a five to seven day period, and you can saturate their muscles with creatine. You can fill their muscles with creatine. And then traditionally, you go on a maintenance dose of about five grams per day. But we also know that you can just take three grams per day and it might take a little bit longer to saturate your muscles, perhaps up to 28 days. But at the end of the day, either doing that loading phase or just consuming a lower dose of creatine for a longer period of time is going to completely saturate your muscles with creatine. So how does creatine work once it gets into your bloodstream and gets close to the muscles? Well, first you need to take creatine in, get creatine into the muscles. And once it's in the muscles, about two thirds of it's converted into phosphocreatine. And phosphocreatine can be broken down very rapidly into ATP, which is the energy currency within the muscle and is important for muscle contractions. So that's one way that creatine works is just by increasing this particular energy system. But we also know, know that if you consume creatine with carbohydrates, that it increases glycogen within the muscle. So any sport like basketball, for example, where glycogen recovery or resynthesis is really important, perhaps you can combine creatine with carbohydrates to get a little bit more glycogen in the muscle. That's also can be broken down into ATP and it's a fuel in the muscle. So if you have more fuel in the muscle, you can exercise a little bit harder perform a few more reps, and you can get bigger and stronger muscles over time. But creatine does a lot more in the muscle than just increasing phosphocreatine. It can act as an antioxidant. It can stimulate IGF-1, it's an anabolic hormone, which leads to a cascade of events. We also know that uh, creatine brings a little bit of water into the muscle cell, and that stimulates what's known as myogenic regulatory factors and activates satellite cells, and that's gonna increase myonuclei. I know this is pretty technical, but uh, myo we know that a muscle cell is myonucleated, so it has multiple nuclei, and you need to increase the amount of nuclei in the muscle before it can actually grow. So one way is through water retention into the muscle cell, stimulates these MRFs, you get more myonuclei, and a greater capacity for the muscle to grow. We also know that creatine can block myostatin, and myostatin 
is the main molecule within the muscle that blocks muscle growth. So we need to inhibit or slow down myostatin. So you can see that creatine works in a variety of different ways. It can increase some muscle anabolic processes through a variety of different pathways, and it could also decrease muscle catabolic processes. So it stops protein breakdown, stops inflammation, and it stops oxidative stress. But what we know is that if you combine creatine with resistance training, that you can get bigger and stronger muscles. And some of the best evidence comes from some anecdotal evidence from Stefan Diaz here. Look how big he was when he took creatine. So of course we can't believe anecdotal evidence, um, so we need to look at the science. And this was a recent systematic review and meta-analysis that we published. And this was focused on older adults. And we looked at the influence of taking creatine combined with resistance training on enhancing lean tissue mass and strength. And so we combine all these studies together and we look at this black diamond at the very bottom. And if, if it falls to the right of this vertical line, it means that it favors creatine. So creatine works. And in this case, we know that creatine in, improved both strength and upper uh, upper and lower body strength and also lean tissue mass in this older population. So there's pretty good science to support that creatine actually works as a supplement. We also know that creatine can enhance muscle mass in younger individuals as well. And we have a very large meta-analysis and systematic review um, that's currently under review. So don't tell anyone about these results yet. It hasn't been published but I can assure you that creatine works in both younger and older adults, um, but it must be combined with exercise to get the greatest benefits. And if you don't believe myself, maybe you'll believe uh, other labs. Um, and this was one study here that they looked at all the nutritional interventions that uh, were combined with resistance training to see if they can have a, an effect on muscle mass strength and physical function. And I was really excited with this conclusion that only creatine showed a synergistic effect of resistance training on muscle mass. Or the other way I would conclude this particular review is that creatine is the king of supplements. So if you're trying to get bigger, stronger muscles and enhance function, you should really consider creatine supplementation. So what's the best type of creatine? You might have seen in social media, there's all these different alternative forms of creatine. And if you go to a supplement store, there's there could be 20 or 30 or 40 different types of creatine that they're trying to sell you. And so there was a recent uh, review that was published in the Journal of Strength and Conditioning Research. And they looked at all the different alternative forms of creatine to see if there was any you know, benefits of, of taking these alternative forms of creatine. And what they concluded was that creatine monohydrate was the best. So there is no other form of creatine that's been shown to be superior from a performance perspective. And we know that creatine monohydrate is the most researched. I would say about 90 to 95 percent of creatine research has been done on creatine monohydrate. And with all that research, we know that creatine monohydrate is extremely safe. But probably the best reason and one thing that really caught my attention in this review was that creatine monohydrate is the cheapest. So not only is it the most researched, the safest, and um, the best from a performance perspective, it's also the cheapest. So my wife knows that I'm a, I'm an extremely cheap individual and uh, it used to be um, to get a five gram serving. It was about 29 cents. So in, in Canada, it looks like this, uh, a moose and a, a beaver. But this an equivalent of US dollars is, is probably only one cent US. So when's the best time to take creatine? So now hopefully I've convinced you that creatine is important to help you build muscle and get stronger. And we know that creatine monohydrate is best, but when's the best time? 
There was actually some previous research to show that taking creatine close to a training session is beneficial from a resistance training adaptation perspective, but we wanted to know whether taking creatine before or after training was better. And so we used what's known as a within subject design. So the previous studies used a between subject design. So that is where you would be randomized to get either creatine before training and, or creatine after training. So let's say Stefan gets randomized to get creatine after training. I would join the study and I would get creatine before training and we would see how our muscles would grow over time and how strong we would get over time. But we are different people. We have different genetics. We have different dietary intakes. And so um, that could have influenced the findings. So we decided to use this within subject design. So this is where we actually randomize one side of the body to get creatine before training and the other side of the body to get creatine after training. So this controls for genetics, uh, uh, dietary intake and sleep, all those things that could potentially influence muscle adaptations over time. So each side of their body trained twice a week and they trained for eight, eight weeks. And we looked at how strong each side of their body got with 1RM testing. And we also measured muscle size with an ultrasound. So here's one of the, the best subjects right here, um, measuring his elbow flexors, his bicep size, which is the most important muscle group. And here on the ultrasound, you can see this solid uh, white line here, which is the humerus. And at the top is the epidermis, the skin. And then you can see a little bit of subcutaneous fat or adipose tissue. And below that, you can see the striations and that's the muscle tissue. And so this is a very sensitive tool to look at changes in muscle size over time. So what did we find? We actually found that there was no difference between taking creatine before training or after training. So you can take creatine whenever you want. We also know that you can take creatine during training as well, and that's a very effective strategy. So you can take it before, during, or after. Whatever your individual preference is, you're going to get the same benefits over time. And we've also recently published, just on May 20th, a review looking at all the creatine timing studies. So if you want to learn more about some of the nuances behind those studies and some of the limitations in future research, you can definitely uh, search up this article. And then one of the other benefits of creatine is that it can also improve how your brain functions. I mentioned at the start that your brain can synthesize its own creatine, but we also know that if you supplement with creatine that you can get more creatine in your brain. And there could be a host of benefits from that. And so again, we've written a, a review on the effects of creatine supplementation on, on brain function and health. And this was in collaboration with some really smart researchers, and I was fortunate to lead this group on this particular publication. And we also know that uh, creatine can improve memory. This article is also under review. It's been through one round of revision, so hopefully it will be published soon as well. But we know that creatine can enhance memory, and we have some strong evidence to support this, which is pretty cool. And we also know um, with uh, collaborations with some uh, Brazilian colleagues that uh, creatine can improve reaction time. So any sport where you need to react quickly to opponents and things like that, um, creatine could be a benefit over time. So in this particular study, we used three grams of creatine for 28 days and it made their visual reaction time faster. And then we also know that creatine can affect other tissues as well, like your bones. And so this is uh, in collaboration with some, again, some fabulous researchers, uh, Dr. Ostajik. Um, he's probably one of the most prolific re uh, creatine researchers in the world. Um, Dr. Tacito from Brazil and uh, Dr. Darren Kandau. He's a, a good friend of mine and a really good collaborator and does a lot of research looking at the benefits of creatine on bone health. 
And so there's a couple ways that creatine can enhance bone strength. If you have bigger and stronger muscles, those muscles are pulling on the bone and that could lead to um, bone development over time. But we also know that if you, in cell culture models, they had osteoblasts. Those are the bone forming cells. They sprinkled a little bit of the magic powder, creatine on it, and it increased the activity of those osteoblasts. And when we look at the literature, um, we show some benefits of creatine supplementation combined with resistance training compared to just resistance training alone on bone health. And, uh, but it appears like a higher dose of creatine might be required. So instead of the traditional five grams a day, that's what most people would recommend from a muscle perspective, it might be six to 10 grams per day of creatine to get improvements in bone strength. And then last but not least is creatine safe. And creatine is probably one of the most studied supplements on the planet. And there is hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of studies to show that creatine is extremely safe. And we tried to answer this in uh, two recent articles. So the one on the bottom here was common questions and misconceptions associated with creatine. There are a lot of myths associated with creatine, including, um, you know, does creatine cause baldness? Is creatine a steroid? Is creatine um, good for females or bad for females? Um, so we try to answer all those questions um, in this particular article, which is an open access article. So you can just Google search the title. And this particular article was published in 2019, and it's been accessed over 100,000 times. So there's definitely a lot of interest in creatine. And then we've also shown that creatine is extremely safe in healthy individuals on their kidneys. So there's a lot of, uh, again, myths and misconceptions that creatine is bad for your kidneys, but in the recommended doses in a healthy individual, creatine is extremely safe. If somebody has a pre-existing kidney disease, of course, I would recommend that they go talk to their medical professionals before supplementing with creatine. So just to summarize here, so creatine must be combined with exercise. So unfortunately, you got to go to the gym, lift some heavy weight. But if you do that and you combine it with creatine, you get bigger and stronger muscles. And this is not just for younger individuals trying to get jacked. It's also important for older adults that are also trying to just maintain muscle as they age and function as they age. The best form of creatine is creatine monohydrates. So you might go into a supplement store and they might tell you otherwise, but trust me, there is not there is no science to support that. Um, so if they think there's something that's better, we need the science to support it before we can conclusively say that an alternative form but presently, we know that creatine monohydrate is the best. And then when to take creatine, you can ingest it before, during, or after training, but I suggest to consume it close to your training session. And then some of the, the newest research shows that creatine can enhance memory. So maybe you guys should take a little bit of creatine before these presentations and you'll remember a little bit more. Um, and then we also know that a higher dose of creatine may be required to enhance bone strength. So it can influence other tissues besides your, your brain and your muscles. Um, it could also enhance your bone. And we also know, last but not least, that creatine is very safe when recommended or when ingested in the recommended doses. So thanks for listening. Um, I put my email address here as well. Um, so you can contact me on email if you don't want to contact me on Instagram, if you're not a social media person. Um, but of course, I'm also on social media as well. So Scott underscore Forbes underscore PhD. So thanks for listening. I think we're going to do a, a roundtable discussion at the end of the presentations today. So I'll answer questions then. Thank you. Very good. Nice, Scott. Very nice presentation. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, guys, keep it up. Uh, write it down your questions. We're going to have the roundtable at the end. So now, so we don't lose time, let me introduce Jacqueline Sk Sklaver, if I say correct. Yeah. 
She is a nationally recognized, board certified, and licensed functional medicine sports nutritionist. Her company, At Eats, very nice company, guys, works with extensive profile of fitness enthusiasts, professional athletes, working with body composition, performance, recovery, injury prevention. Jacqueline has coached over 400 elite level athletes, preparing them for draft, off-season workouts, 80 NFL, NBA veterans throughout 12-month calendar. She is also the dietitian, the former world heavyweight champion, Deontay Wilder. And then she recently got hired by the Orlando Magic as director of high performance nutrition. Thank you, Jacqueline. Thank you. Okay, I'm going to try to screen share here and hopefully this works because this is all new for me. Let's see, screen share. Um, you need your permission to share your screen. Okay, give me one second. I need to get permissions to screen share here. Um, sorry. You're fine. I couldn't find the record button. <laughs> Uh oh, it's saying. Do you have my um, slide presentation? I think Jeff need to 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 allow you to to screen share. Oh, do you? No, this is saying I need to allow Microsoft screen. It's telling me I need to uh, allow Teams to screen share, but I have to. I need an admin password, which I don't have. Yeah. So that could be a problem. Can you? I did email it to you. Did you get that? Yeah, the problem was in the email got blocked because it was kind of like. So um, can you email to to Jeff real quick? Jeff, can you put in the email in the, on the chat? Yeah, I can do it. Yes, please. Just give me one second. Um. Who am I sending it to? Jeff, you said? Yeah. Yes. My chat taking forever to pop up. It's J E F F Williams at Kaiser University edu. Can you put in the chat, Jeff, please? I'm trying. My my chat isn't popping up. Oh. <laughs> Some little technical <laughs> issues, but we're gonna fix. Right. Okay, I just sent it. Hopefully that goes through. Even if, if I can't get it, Stefan, if you can, you can just share it from your screen. Yeah, once you. Oh. I put his, uh, put Jeff's email in on the chat. No, I know I have it. I just, I'm I have waiting for it to. Did you get it? Yeah, it's scanning. I don't know why it's not letting me. Sometimes the teams depends on the organization has some. Uh, yeah, and I've never used teams. I'm an Apple person, so. Yeah, same. Is it letting uh, you into the. Yeah, it says I have to enter a code that was sent to your email from the Orlando Magic. OK, that, all right, that, zero. No, 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 it's fine. I just want to make sure we get it. Question. In this meantime, uh, question for for Dr. Squat. On creatine. Oh, could be later if you want. Is this safe for use during pregnancy or breastfeeding? That's that's a really good question. Um, there was actually a recent review that was written that was written on uh, 
creatine during pregnancy. Um, I'm, I'm, that's not my area of expertise, so I can uh, post that particular review in the chat and uh, yeah, the individual that's interested in that could, could definitely uh, go and read that article. But I know that there is some limited evidence um, that it could be a benefit during the pregnancy and uh, particularly during uh, the birthing process, if the baby gets cut off from oxygen and circulation, that that's uh, obviously a very stressful environment. Um, but if they have creatine or they supplement it with creatine, um, there's less uh, risk or damage that can occur in that situation to the baby. So um, yeah, I've, I have seen some benefits of, of creatine supplementation during pregnancy. But uh, again, I would refer to that particular article. And from my understanding, there's there's limited research in humans. Um, so a lot of the research has been done in an animal model. So you need to be cautious when you're interpreting that. Thank you, thank you. Jacqueline, I, I put my hotmail there. If you yeah. can email to my I, hotmail sometimes. I, my, my big problem here is that I am not, an, um, I'm a Mac person, so I'm just like really trying to figure this whole system out here with this Microsoft stuff. I just sent it to you. Okay. To the... Next question too, since we're waiting. Yeah, no problem. Uh, Dr. Uh, Scott or Ford or doctor, I don't know how you want to be called. Um, so would you... What's your view in supplementing with creatine when and body composition? Like, would you wait if you had an athlete that was like over 30% body fat? Would you still supplement with creatine and see the same benefits, you think? Or would you wait until that body composition is, you know, a little lower, improved, I guess? That, that's another great question. And we actually found that individuals that took creatine and resistance trained, they, they actually lost um, a greater percentage of body fat. And so it's a small, like they lost um, about 0.5 kilograms more fat mass than those that just resistance trained and took a placebo. So mm -hmm. creatine actually helps you lose a little bit of fat mass. Mm -hmm. So I would suggest that... Uh, yeah, creatine could be a benefit in that situation. Mm -hmm. And then, of course, if it helps you put on muscle mass, that can be important as well from a health perspective. Mm -hmm. And so, yeah, I would suggest that anyone that's considering to improve their body composition um, should really consider creatine. Okay, thanks. You're welcome. Should be a cold. Jacqueline, yeah, I, I had the code from the last person. I haven't gotten that code yet from here. I had a code from the last person I sent it to, but I don't know what happened to that. Um, Can you email it to my hotmail? If no, we got to just you talk and then we just listen. <laughs> I mean, the last code that came through was 021757. You want to try that, Jeff? I got it. Oh, yes. Let's go. Can I just make one more comment about that yeah. last question? Yeah, for no. sure. No. So, <laughs> um, obviously, uh, creatine is going to bring water into the muscle cell. And so um, that's one of the, the side effects of creatine is you typically gain a little bit of weight because of that water retention. And so that's something to consider. If somebody's trying to lose weight, yes, it's going to improve their body composition, but it will require a little bit of education to that individual because their weight on the scale might go up a little bit, but that's uh, their body competition composition is actually being improved. So you just need to let them know that, yeah, they might retain a little bit of water. And so there's their weight might go up, but don't worry about it. It's actually helping you lose fat mass and helping you put on lean body mass, which is, of course, a benefit. Great. OK, let's go, Jeff. OK, I saw the slideshow. Where'd it go? Got to. OK, all right, guys, so I'm going to be talking about nutrition for injury recovery. Um, one of the things that we know is that your body, your metabolism actually changes after you have injury or surgery. Um, how do I go to the next page here? 
You should be able to click it because I just gave you the access. Um, so, OK, there we go. All right, let me go backwards. Um, so some of the things that happen after an injury is that your body needs extra nutrients brought to itself. So our red blood cells are going to need more nutrients. Our metabolic demand on our body actually goes up 20%. So your resting metabolic rate times 1.2 is what we look at for your actual resting metabolic rate. So that's before any activity. Um, and depending on the injury, you might still be able to be a little active if you are an athlete. So we definitely want to consider that your metabolism goes up 20%. And your protein demand increases by 20% as well because there's so much rebuilding of cells going on. And one of the mistakes that we see is that people will undereat and they're not allowing themselves enough nutrients to really be able to increase their recovery or to recover it in uh, ample time. And we've seen um, upwards of increasing about 30% faster uh, with injury recovery for people who follow the right nutritional protocols. Um, so some of the key considerations are eating enough food and eating enough protein. And we'll talk about some of the strategies later on because as most people know, after surgery or injury, sometimes your appetite does go down. Um, one of the other things we wanna do is really control inflammation. And we can do that by avoiding fried foods, processed foods, and junk foods. So we have three stages of healing, and I think there's somebody speaking on this afterwards, but we have inflammation, which happens in the first week. And that's actually a process that we do want to happen because that helps bring blood into the cells. Then we have pl proliferation, which is about two to four weeks afterwards. And that's when we're rebuilding our cells and tissues and then remodeling. And that could be anywhere from four weeks to two years if we're doing a bone injury. And that's when we're really strengthening and we have long-term repair. So how we can support this from a nutritional standpoint, and when we talk about week one, that would be the first week after the injury. And then if you go in for surgery, and sometimes we have to wait for the inflammation to go down to go into surgery, we'll start week one over again after the surgery. Um, so what we want to do here is we really want to balance inflammation through an anti-inflammatory diet and through some supplements. And as Scott mentioned, we do a food first approach, but after surgery, usually we will support with food, but we are going to need some supplements because the dosages are much higher than we can get through food. Um, we want to keep inflammation. We do want inflammation to help, but we want to keep it a little bit lower so it doesn't get out of control and limit our mobility and damage any healthy tissues around the injury. So some of the nutrients we really focus on are leucine, arginine, and glutamine. They become in higher demand. Some of our um, essential non-essential amino acids become conditionally essential, meaning we're actually going to need to take them during this time. Our body's not going to produce them. And then our focus on supplements will be curcumin, collagen, uh, vitamin C, vitamin A, fish oils, um, enzymes, and zinc. And we'll get into that a little bit more as we go along. So in two to four weeks, when we're rebuilding our new cells and we're re removing the dead cells from the area, this is similar to what I tell people like when we're in the weight room, right? Where we're rebuilding cells and muscle tissue. So we really need to focus on eating enough to rebuild these cells. Just like if you're in there lifting heavy weights and you're in a hypertrophy phase, we are in a hypertrophy phase for every cell in our body. So under eating is gonna significantly slow down this process. Um, and we also want to continue supplements throughout this time. So two to four weeks is when we really want to sit down and try to think to ourselves, okay, you know, we're out of this funk of the injury. Let's really focus on what we're putting into our body right now, especially because a lot of people are not going to be as active or maybe not training as much. This is always a good time to be able to focus on what you're eating. And the two, four weeks to two years and beyond, um, you know, this is a time where once we start to ramp up our training a little bit, we'll start to increase our carbs a little bit. Um, you know, immediately after surgery and when we're not active, we will lower our carbs down because we're not as active. And depending on how active this athlete was, they don't need to be taking in 600, 800 carbs a day, but they do need to be taking in protein. So whatever food they can get in, we really want to focus on that protein. Uh, as they start physical therapy and ramping up training, we'll start to increase that. Um, and we want to focus here. This is where the anti-inflammatory diet really comes in. And I say beyond because this is the way we should be always eating. You know, we want to have like whole grain carbs, um, make sure we're really focusing on getting our eight hours of sleep for our repair, having protein every three to four hours. Uh, meditation is really great to help lower stress levels. 
having healthy fats in our diet um, to support to support our metabolism, really focusing on on water and electrolytes and making sure that our cells are hydrated, our joints are hydrated. Um, once again, our supplements that we're going to kind of focus on beyond just the the initial stage is going to be like our curcumin, which is an antioxidant and anti-inflammatory, vitamin D, collagen to help with our joint and tendon health, and our fish oils to also help with inflammation and pain management. And then there's anti-inflammatory herbs and fruits that we can do for foods, but uh, you know, some of our fruits like pineapple have proteolytic enzymes and they also can help with inflammation. So one of the things that people forget is that there can be a lot of stress and depression after an injury, especially if you're you know, an athlete who's playing at a higher level um, or you're just a regular person who's used to being active. You know, A lot of stress can come along with that and then you don't want to eat. And so you're, you know, the last thing you want to do is eat. Uh, or there's the flip side where some people will turn to food. So we have to think about the mental state there of people maybe using comfort foods. And, and, and that's where I say, really be careful with your snacks that you're having. Um, so we want to really think about what our body's going through at this time period. And although it can be stress and it can be depressing, it's important to really keep up your fueling during this time and not to just let it go because you're not in the gym every day or training every day. Um, okay. So anti-inflammatory diet, which, you know, people may or may not be um, familiar with, the anti-inflammatory diet is kind of the lifestyle diet that most people should have and definitely athletes should have. And so some of the things we focus on here, and you may have heard of like a Mediterranean style diet that's very similar, um, you know, we want to have lean proteins, so lean meats, um, fatty fishes like salmon and tuna and mackerel. We want to have olive oils and flaxseed oils, avocado oils. Nuts and seeds are great. Um, low glycemic fruits, and then also fruits that have some nutrients in it like guava, pineapple, and papaya. They have what I mentioned before, which are those proteoloic enzymes that can help with inflammation. Um, our berries are really high in antioxidants, so they're great. You can put them in shakes, dark leafy greens, all different types of vegetables. We're really looking at kind of eating like the purples and the oranges and the yellows are antioxidant filled vegetables and fruits. Uh, shellfish is really great for zinc. We talked about lean meats, our probiotic foods to help with our gut health, because usually after injury, we're, we're sometimes on a lot of medication and sometimes even antibiotics if there's been, been a surgery. Um, once again, whole grains and carbs, spices, spices are great antioxidants. So like adding spices into our foods and ginger and turmeric and then drinks, you know, green tea helps with antioxidants, beet juice helps with blood flow, uh, coconut water for hydration. So there's a lot we can do through our actual diet. Um, and then here I just kind of broke down the actual nutrients that are coming in from each food. And you can see here, like our vitamin A, we want to think about our orange and yellow foods. Um, when we think about our antioxidants, we want to think about our, our pomegranates, like our reds and our purple foods. So a lot of our foods that are, that are full of nutrients are our colorful foods. And some meal ideas. So people are like, okay, this is great. How am I going to put that into play? Right. So I tell people like, so a meal idea post injury, you know, having like two cups of like Greek yogurt with some mixed berries and some nuts in it. Um, adding in some hemp seeds if you want to get some extra fats. For some people, getting in the calories is a challenge. And so we want to do some fat foods with fat because they're double the calories. So you want to think about like avocados, nuts, seeds, olive oils, adding that into your food so that you can get more calories in. Um, another thing you might want to do like eggs with some whole grain toast or avocado, pineapple, or like grits and oatmeal with some turkey bacon. So those are some breakfast ideas. Um, you know, lunch and dinner can kind of look similar and make it easy and you can meal prep. Um, and you know, you have your grilled chicken with rice and beans and guacamole or some wild salmon with sweet potatoes and spinach, um, some curried chicken and snacks you wanna keep around. You know, ready to drink protein shakes are great. You can just grab and go. And nowadays they have like 30, some of them have 42 grams of protein. Um, having like oranges and almonds and just easy to eat, you know, maybe the mini mandarin oranges. Um, pumpkin seeds are great also for B vitamins and zinc. And then like almond butter and jelly, you know, almond butter and jelly is an easy one. I say almond butter because in case you don't know, you know, peanuts are a legume, not a nut. So they can be a little more inflammatory. So I tend to go to the almond butter side. Um, and then having jerky 
around for protein and salted pretzels and stuff are really good too. Um, and one of the things we also want to consider after injury or surgery is our gut health, because if you are going into surgery, it's really rough on your digestive system. So not just you have the anesthesia, but you also have the painkillers. And you may also be on painkillers if you had a pretty tough injury. And this can make you constipated. So on top of all the other stuff, now you're constipated. So we really want to think about that going in. Um, make sure for women, at least 25 grams of fiber and men have 38 grams of fiber a day, you might need a little bit more if you're actually on painkillers uh, or after surgery. And you may also need to think about before going into surgery, I always tell people like kind of have this at your house. Uh, you might need like a Miralax or something like that to help you. Um, but you definitely wanna really, really focus on those high fiber foods and having probiotic foods to help in case you do get antibiotics. So those are Greek yogurt, uh, you could drink some kefir, sauerkraut, any kind of pickled foods, uh, fruits and veg pickled vegetables. Um, those are things like kimchi, if you like that, to keep that around as well. But people kind of forget that you're going to have gut problems. And also uh, ginger, even ginger candies can help with nausea um, because the medicine they give you for nausea also constipates you. So we would definitely want to keep that in mind after for our treatments for our injuries. Um, so that's pretty much a summary of everything here that that's everything we want to focus on for, for our uh, injury nutrition. My contact information is here. I'm also now at the Orlando Magic, so um, I can be reached there. My Instagram, I try to put a lot of educational information on there. Um, I do have a, a summary, summarized handout that I'll give so that that can be distributed to everybody who's on the call as well. Kind of goes over everything I spoke about. It's like a nice little reference PDF and goes into the supplements in a little more detail as well. Um, because there are protocols that we taper off between one week, two to four weeks, and then so forth. Thank you. Thank you. You're welcome. Very good, Jacqueline. So, guys, save your questions. I have a bunch of questions for you, Jacqueline, for the end. Let me see if Chris Swagger is there. Chris, are you there? I know he's on the uh, call. Yes, I, yes, yes, I am here. Uh, I won't good. have access to my camera, but I am able don't, to talk. So. Don't, don't worry, don't worry, my friend. Let me do a quick introduction here. Chris is very busy, guys. Just for you know, Chris became the Kaiser Universe second director of athletics in September 2016. From July 16 to September 16, he served as the interim director of athletics. Prior to that, he was assistant athletic director at Kaiser University. Swagger joined Seahawk Nation, Seahawk at Kaiser in February 2011. Since that time, the department has grown from 242 athletes to over 750 athletes. I think it's, it's even bigger now. And then from 11 in AIA varsity sports to 26 varsity sports. The past six seasons have been uh, very important for Kaiser. Some of the success that Chris was in charge in, in um, important. So that 703 all-conference athletes, 412 academic all-conference and then 62 teams rank, and then three Sun Commissioners, one Leadership Director's Cup. So the list goes on. Very good. So, Chris, without losing some time, talk to us a little bit about uh, recovery strategy that you guys use or anything that you feel free to share with us, please. Okay, great. Um, well, first, thanks for having me. And, and uh, the first two presentations are great. I, I learned a lot. Um, so I, I really want to speak more on behalf of kind of the administrator role how I view um, our sports medicine staff, how they interact with our athletes and what the expectations are. So, um, you know, uh, obviously we, the numbers are read off. We're a large athletic department. We have 26 varsity sports, over 750 student athletes, and we also see some non-varsity sports. So overall we have close to 800 student athletes. Um, when I first started, uh, we did not have a, a very robust sports medicine program. Uh, we had a few athletic trainers. We did not have a strength and conditioning department. Uh, really, that was overseen by each coach. Uh, so there were a lot of inconsistencies, uh, a lot of people who tried hard but weren't educated. Um, and so that was one of the main focuses uh, about four to five years ago. And so a lot of our success, I think, is because of that. Um, our sports medicine department uh, has both athletic trainers and our strength and conditioning staff there. They both work simultaneously. Uh, on injury prevention, but also on recovery strategies and rehab. 
Uh, we have, we do everything in house. Uh, obviously when someone comes out of a major surgery, uh, typically for the first two weeks, we do not work with them, but once they're clear by our team physician, then we would take over from there. So uh, our athletic trainers would start and then uh, pass them off to our sports or our strength and conditioning coaches once they get to a certain point. Um, but really our focus is injury prevention. So we, we talk a lot about simulating uh, movements that would happen in the sport. Um, we talk a lot about, you know, we do high intensity interval training. Uh, typically a team's going to do three workouts a week for no more than 40 minutes. Uh, and, and really the most important thing is communication. So um, from coaches to athletic trainers, strength and conditioning coaches, they all have to be on the same page. So I'm always meeting with those staff. This is called sportswear, which logs all of our sports injuries. They all have access to it. They go over the injury reports. To do on the overlap. So in other words, around practice schedules and not just um, the time frame, but also the intensity that the coaches are going to work with. Uh, one of the things that we first noticed as we grew, and, and I'm kind of talking on a larger scale as far as with a lot of student athletes, uh, we have uh, nine athletic trainers, four strength and conditioning coaches, and two to three strength and conditioning uh, graduate assistants. So not as large as some, but but larger than, than most. And so there's a lot of meetings and a lot of discussions and a lot of back and forth with changing plans up uh, around what the coaches are going to do in practices, how the season is going. If you have an outdoor sport who uh, potentially has rain issues or rain delays or rescheduling of games, uh, we don't want to lose any of the time on injury prevention. We don't want to lose any time on rehab. We don't want to lose any any time on on getting getting athletes at a high performance level. Uh, so we want to make sure that we're on the same page adjusting schedules. Um, the, the other big part, and, and it was mentioned a little bit earlier, is with any injury, uh, but even sometimes when someone is doing better, there is a mental component. And I do see athletic training and strength and conditioning um, as a huge, huge asset for breaking barriers, fighting through um, different um, issues. And I'm not necessarily speaking on mental health, but when someone gets injured, a lot of times they're, they're separate from the team. They're obviously doing their own rehab. They're interacting um, on a different level than their teammates. Um, so it's a strength and conditioning and athletic trainer job to really motivate them, keep them going, set clear cut goals, timelines for recovery, adjust those as they're going on, um, continue to make sure that, that they're breaking through different hurdles. Um, there's a sports psychology side to it, which you are, we also have someone on staff that deals with that. Um, but then also on the, uh, on just the performance side on the front end, you know, I, I, most of our times, and, and I would assume this is probably consistent for most colleges and pro teams, uh, most of the strength and conditioning times are not at a time you typically would want to be there. So a lot of our times are 6 a.m., 5 a.m., um, you know, some different times throughout the day that just, you know, someone doesn't really feel motivated, to be honest with you. So there's a lot of uh, intent behind that as well to help, again, people push through barriers, establish good habits, um, make sure that they are um, performing when they their body may not really want to be. Um, we don't get a, a lot into the nutrition. That's our next phase in the department. But we, we do we do talk about it on a low level. We don't have anyone that um, is experienced as, as, you know, the people on this call, uh, the presenters. But we do get into that a little bit and on the base level and kind of make sure that they're doing what they need to do. But we definitely want to make sure that um, – you know, they are taking care of the body, they're getting proper sleep, proper nutrition, they're hydrated, uh, you know, recovery stuff. Uh, if, if we're going on the road, you know, we have a multitude of things that we do between ice baths and compression boots and um, different things that that staff takes over. So they run their, their department like their own team. Um, there's a lot of collaboration with the coaches, but then there's also, also a lot of personal responsibility for their athletes. And, and it's a it's a tricky job because you're you're kind of living in two worlds, right? You're you're interacting with the coaches, you're getting their feedback, you're designing workouts around kind of what their game plan is. Um, you know, for, for an example, uh, you know, basketball. We we've had three different styles of, of play. We've had a high pressing, high intensity, 
about 10 deep uh, a couple of years ago. That's the way our coach, you know, played. And then we switched over to probably a lower uh, seven or eight man rotation, less full court pressing, more half court pressing, uh, a lot more trapping and physical play. So there's a strategy between that coaching style and, and the workouts and the different um, preparation for the season that we all want everyone to be on the same page. But then there's also the side of it where um, when, it, when a student athlete steps in a, into the weight room, they are now that strength and conditioning coach's responsibility. It is their room. That is their practice schedule. That is their team in a sense. So they need to uphold the same standards as the department, but they also need to run that almost as an independent unit, motivating the students, interacting with the students, having those conversations, uh, having separate meetings if needed. So um, there's a lot of a lot of communication, a lot of um, collaboration with other people, a lot of organization, but it, it is very important. Um, I think it, it is essential to having an elite team and an elite department. And I, I think over the last couple of years, I think in both coaching, or I'd say in coaching, strength and conditioning, and athletic training, um, there's a lot more emphasis on interaction with the students because there are a lot more mental health issues that we are seeing. Uh, there is a lot more depression. There's a lot more, I don't want to say second guessing, but just a lot more of the mental side that coaches are getting involved in. And I think a lot of the things that we do to keep kids healthy and to keep them playing and to keep them focus on what they need to do helps them fight through those barriers. I'll, I'll kind of end there because I went over a lot right there, but I, I definitely, uh, you know, I think hopefully spurred some some thoughts. I'm happy to answer any questions at the end. Yes, thank you. Thank you so much, Chris. Uh, so, Jeff, um, do you have a question to start or do you want to read a question or let anybody? Um. I actually was just curious on, um, I know you had said it during your presentation, Scott, that, you know, there obviously is always better channeling of creatine with carb introduction, right? Um, are we seeing that that's the best way to go? Are we seeing that's the best way? Kind of, You know how, like, post-workout we talk about how, you know, protein open, has channels open because of carbohydrate intake and insulin sensitivity and everything like that. Is that is that probably the better? I mean, I know timing. You said what didn't really matter as much, but is that a good time that we feel can get it in as we need it? Yeah, that's a, an awesome question. So there's there's some pretty solid evidence to show that if you combine creatine with carbohydrates, you're going to actually increase both carbohydrate uptake into the muscle, but also creatine uptake into the muscle as well. Right. And it's through an insulin mediated uh, uh, factor um, affecting the creatine transporters. Mm -hmm. But we also know that consuming protein also stimulates insulin as well. Mm -hmm. And so consuming creatine with protein is another viable strategy to help with creatine uptake. Mm -hmm. I think that's really only important during um, if you're if your focus is trying to saturate your muscles with creatine then that's only important during the loading phase of, of creatine supplementation. Mm -hmm. It's probably not gonna have a major uh, impact over a long period of time from a creatine perspective, but we know that protein is really important for building muscle. And so that if you want to build as much muscle as possible, that's maybe a good strategy is to consume your creatine with your protein shake after you train. And then is that is that kind of like, when we're talking about the protein aspect, are we talking specifically more leucine based because that's so sensitive to insulin? Yeah, so I think there's there was a study done in 2003 actually um, by Darren Burke and Darren Kando, some of my collaborators, and they looked at the combined effects of creatine and whey protein mm -hmm. um, compared to just whey protein alone. And they showed better improvements in muscle mass and strength in the group that combined creatine and pro and protein. Okay. Um, so I think from a protein perspective, yeah, obviously leucine is important to meet uh, a minimal threshold, mm -hmm. but uh, just getting a complete protein source like whey protein is probably the best way long-term. Okay, great. I appreciate that. Very good, very good. Feel free to to ask uh, questions in the chat, guys, or, or raise your hand, or can uh, just turn on your mic, Professor Grimmie. Um, on that same note, what a, 
Well, I know you're saying, you know, the whey proteins or your complete proteins are best. Are you seeing that there are any plant proteins for us non whey protein folks um, that there's any differences there as far as absorption or as far as effectiveness or just it's a little better because the, those are complete sources or should we just be looking at trying to complete those like veggie sources or what have you? Yeah, that's a, a great question as well because there's a big push for a, a plant-based diet. And I think a plant-based diet is very healthy from a, from that perspective. Um, but yeah, the limitation is that there's animal-based proteins are more effective gram, per, gram for gram. Um, but um, all you can, one strategy is just to consume a little bit more plant-based proteins and then you can have the same anabolic response. So in the lab, if you look at yeah, whey protein versus soy protein, whey protein at the same grams, it's going to stimulate more muscle protein synthesis, but it's easy in, in reality just to consume a little bit more protein if you're on a plant-based diet and then uh, you're going to get the same increase in muscle mass and adaptations over time. Nice, thank you. I have a question from Professor Creamings. Yeah, um, awesome presentations, by the way. Um, so something that I hit on myself um, sort of anecdotally and in talking to some other people, um, I think they've hit on it as well, but I'm not sure if there's um, any instances of it in the research. So you talked about five grams being the, the baseline dosage, but we've also seen growing up in this field, I, looking at reading the literature, I always saw, well, there's these non-responders, right? There's maybe up to 25% of the population is a creatine non-responder. And I believed that crap. <laughs> so I thought I was a non-responder for the longest time. And recently I went back to creatine because Dr. Curtis, who I know you work with, is on our campus and he's doing a lot of research alongside with you uh, and Dr. Antonio on creatine and seeing all of these other benefits to creatine. I'm like, I got to get back on this stuff. But I decided to up the dosage. So I went up to about eight, even up to 10 grams a day. And what do you know? I started seeing performance enhancement results. So I'm wondering, is there any research out there that's looking at that? I am a larger person. I'm about 215, 220. So is, is there any research out there that's saying, hey, maybe five grams, that's good for the average person, but there are some people who might need more than that to see the performance enhancing effects? Yeah, that's, that's a great question. Um, and there's no individual study that's actually looked at um, different doses of creatine on muscle performance, but we've actually done a meta-analysis looking at the low dose studies, so five grams and less versus higher dose studies. And the population we looked at was older adults, but we looked at muscle mass and um, strength adaptations, and we showed uh, better benefits with the higher dose of creatine. So in that six to 10 gram range, we also know in theory that, you know, a bigger person's just going to have more muscle mass and going to have more creatine turnover. Right. So in theory, it makes sense that a bigger person's going to require more creatine. And so for a lot of our studies, um, because that just makes sense from a, a logical perspective, we actually give 0.1 grams of creatine per kilogram of body weight per day. So yeah, if you're 220 pounds, that's about 100 kilograms then uh, you would take 10 grams of creatine per day in our studies. Perfect. That makes nice. sense. Very good. I have a question for Chris here. Chris, do you guys uh, use any like massage for recovery? And then uh, if you can talk a little bit, how many sessions they do about a strength and conditioning in a week during season and then off season? If you can talk a little bit about that, please. Uh, we, we do uh, a couple of different massage techniques depending upon the sport. Um, for example, like our swim team, when they go to nationals, they have a, actually have a massage therapist that goes with them. 
uh, for you know lactic acid and different things uh, that stays with them through their through their national tournament just because of the frequency with which they swim. Uh, it's like I believe a four day tournament, so they're swimming um, pretty much every day depending on what events you're in. Um, and then we also just have you know different machines and things on campus for that as well. Uh, we, we utilize a lot of ice baths and, and things like that as well. Um, as far as frequency, we try to keep it consistent. So we try to say no more than four, but typically three, both preseason, during season, and post. But we just change the level. So preseason, we're obviously trying to, to gain some strength while also doing injury prevention. See, in season, it's it's a hundred percent injury prevention. Um, and then postseason, it, it, it's kind of evaluation. We obviously want to gain some strength, but it's also just kind of um, again going back to um, the you know, what worked, um, techniques, things like that. And then, and then really, I mean, no one, no one plays injury free throughout a season. So, uh, there's always something that someone's dealing with, whether that's something, um, you know, from a previous surgery, you know, someone had a knee injury or something like that, or whether that's a rolled ankle that never heals. So a lot of, uh, postseason work is kind of fixing that stuff. It's kind of making sure we're doing things to, strengthen whatever went wrong so we can get them back to their off-season program. So depending upon sport, that'll usually last, uh, you know, four to eight weeks, and then we'll reassess, and then we'll start a new program probably a week or two after that. Very nice. Thank you. And then just uh, one more. So I know with all those athletes, and you said you have kind of like, I believe, four strength coaches. So ideally, we want to do the strength and conditioning uh, training after the technical training so it doesn't have influence. But I know sometimes it's not a reality because of the schedule. So how do you guys manage that to, to, to make sure everybody has a time to train and then and still do their technical work or skill work? Um, so certain sports, like, uh, for example, football is more... Um, just football, and then they'll have two GAs that work with them. So the way our graduate assistants work, they can work alongside a coach. Uh, the coach can design the program, and as long as they're you know in the area, they can work independently, but they can't do it with no one around. Um, so with football, they pretty much just have football, and they actually travel the team. They do their warm-ups. They're doing all their stretching, everything. Uh, for some of the other teams, they'll do the strength and conditioning program, but not travel with them, so they're going to have a higher load. Uh, we typically try to have each strength and conditioning coach have a fall, winter, and spring sport. We try to pair it up as much as possible in similarities. So, for example, um, baseball pitchers, and, and baseball is kind of unique because you got pitchers and then you got uh, position players, and they're kind of two different thoughts and, and beasts, I guess you could say. So, they think a little bit differently and train a little bit differently. But, for example, pitchers, golfers, um, tennis players, I mean, they, they have some similar body movements and things that they focus on. So we try to pair up the strength coach as best as possible with the, with the philosophy. Um, and then from a utilization standpoint, like I said, uh, we've got graduate assistants. We have two weight rooms on campus, um, one of which is 100% athletics. The other one is shared with our student life. So typically that one we'll have in the early morning and late evening. Uh, and then our athletic one, we've got, you know, open pretty much from about 5.30 a.m. to, you know, as late as 8 or 9. Uh, we also do a lot of dry land training, like for swimming, where we, we do a lot of stuff outside as well when we can. So uh, sometimes we may have, you know, the weight sessions inside, but then other times we're doing, you know, whether it be, you know, we got sandbags, sleds, um, you know, different tires, ropes, different things that we do outside also to kind of break it up. Can I add something on there? Yeah, for sure. I'm on the flagship campus. I don't want to step on your toes, Chris, but I, just from my own perspective, what I've seen, um, the teams where there has been um, coaching consistency, where I've seen the head coaches have been there the five years that I've been here, have been working more or less with the same strength coaches, have been working with Dr. Brody for the same amount of time we see a really cohesive system on those teams and we're seeing very few injuries. I mean, the amount of injuries that uh, we've seen on the football team, it's truly remarkable. There have been very, very few injuries over the four, five years that the football team has been here on campus. 
there is a little bit more fluctuation on some of the other teams where we've seen a little bit more coaching turnover and a little bit more strength coaching turnover and there's less of a system in place it feels like but like the swim team the football team uh, women's basketball where we've had the same consistency it's you know it is a well-oiled machine at this point and we're seeing very few injuries um across the board it's really been quite impressive yeah i would i would add yeah and i don't disagree i think the other thing that to look at depending upon the sport and i'm not i'm not putting a sport down or not but but when you get into for example i'll say golf tennis baseball those sports what one of the challenges right now is is those are sports predominantly that everyone has a coach. When I mean that, like a hitting coach or a hitting instructor or someone else. So for some of the sports, a lot of it too, and, and I would guess for this profession in general, is getting the belief of the person you're working with um, because there's all these different people, in, in, you know, voices in people's ears. So I think the follow-up on what you're saying, in, in those particular sports, the coach, the training staff, the strength and conditioning coach, and the kids were all on the same page, and they believed it and they followed it and they're doing what they're supposed to do. In others, there's some uh, pushback. And obviously in the sports you mentioned, they've been highly successful, so that, that also helps because the results are there. Um, but, but again, what I said earlier, communication is the biggest part. Um, I think if, when you have turnover, what happens is the communication is kind of lacking. And so there, if you're on two different pages, again, to go back to practice routines and style of play, um, modifying, workouts and modifying what you do to the strength of the team or what they're going to do is a huge part of that. So you're not overloading. I mean, for example, um, you know, if a coach typically runs or does something with their team after a game, then obviously you want to not have a heavy day for both sides and a light day on the next. So um, making sure that that strength coach is communicating with the coaches, making sure they have a plan to adjust, um, you know, just making sure that everything flows as well as with athletic training. Again, like I said, they meet on injury reports. They get them uh, every after every game for sure. But then typically we'll have them throughout the week, too, in case there's anything else major. And then making sure because surprise, surprise, kids will lie. And kids will say different things that um, some of them want to get out of workouts and some don't. And so sometimes there's kids that come in with, a, with an injury or a, a concern or they need to do a modified lift and they don't want to tell the strength coach. And then there's other times where phantom injuries occur. And so the communication is key in making sure we identify them, we adjust. And again, you know, we make sure that we just prevent injury and then help kids get back as, as quickly as possible. Nice, thank you. We have a question in the chat uh, from Professor Snowden to Dr. Forbes. Have you seen any correlation with nutritional supplementation in column polyps if i'm reading correct um yeah that's that's a great question and i honestly have have no idea i haven't seen any uh correlation um but i think always with supplementation it's it's important to have a really healthy diet first and i think jacqueline did a great job of kind of that anti-inflammatory diet and talking about lots of fruits and vegetables and getting a variety of colors on your plate and things like that so um, I think that's an important consideration when we talk about supplements um, and when I talk about the benefits of creatine, that's we need to make sure you're eating enough protein, you're eating enough calories, you're getting, you know, good, healthy foods and uh, not just living off of supplements, because if you just live off supplements, I'm sure there could be some negative health consequences associated with that. Perfect. Thank you. And then I have a person for you, uh, Professor. Uh, I know there's research saying that you can use creatine, let's say, for many years in a row, let's say five years. Do you recommend stopping it or, or no? Just keep it going as long as when that those that we talk from five to ten. And then also I have a, a friend, an athlete that's kind of like a cyclist because we know uh, endurance sport. And then we also mentioned about the weight. So is that good or no? And if you can talk about it, please. Yeah, so the, the first question, do you have to cycle on and off creatine? Um, we're currently running a study to answer that particular question. Um, so there's no science to show that cycling on and off is just as good or maybe it's worse than taking it continuously. We know that we uh, provided creatine for two years daily 
and it's perfectly safe and healthy to do so. Um, so that's what the evidence would suggest. And then your second question was associated with weight gain and cycling performance. So um, I would suggest if, if you're a runner, you need to be somewhat cautious of putting on a little bit of water weight and um, increasing your body mass because that could actually be detrimental from a running performance perspective. But it can also help you with glycogen resynthesis, can help you with muscular recovery, um, reducing inflammation. So those could be a benefit. So I think you need to be a bit strategic when you provide creatine for runners. But there was one study done in cyclists and it was conducted at the Australia Institute of Sport and they did 120 kilometer time trials. So pretty crazy. I don't think I've ever biked that far or even biked that far in my entire life, but they did 120 kilometer time trials and every 10 kilometers they switched from doing either a one kilometer sprint as fast as they could or a four kilometer sprint. So they did these different surges every 10 kilometers throughout the 120 kilometer race. And they found that those that took creatine um, improved those sprints or those surges at the end of the 120 kilometer uh, cycling time trial. So there is uh, potentially some benefits for uh, cyclists to consider creatine, um, especially for those, yeah, those surges in a race where you have to really be really powerful and create a lot of ATP very rapidly. Um, I think creatine could be a benefit in those situations. Perfect. Thank you. And then uh, one more for me. I know our time here almost at the end. And then you mentioned something that you can use before and after. That's pretty much the same results. Now a personal question for you, because sometimes let's say if I use it before and then I like creatine too, and then sometimes you feel, you know, a little bit kind of like in the jazz or you, you kind of like this, right? It's too close to the, to the training. So what do you recommend or if you can say something about it, please? Yeah, so you can you can take it after training if that's uh, if that's if it makes you a little bit, you know, if your stomach feels uncomfortable when you take a, a dose of creatine. Um, so, yeah, my recommendation is just to take it after training and you can wait 30 minutes, 60 minutes. It, it's probably not a big deal. Um, I wouldn't wait too, too long. So the study that actually looked at taking creatine close to your training session, um, they showed greater benefits if you took it close uh, close to the training versus greater than five hours away from the training session. So we don't know anything in between, um, but uh, my assumption is that if you wait an hour or even two hours, it's probably not gonna make any difference from a adaptation perspective. Perfect, thank you. Anybody, any other question guys? We're almost done here. So before we finish, if I don't see in the chat, uh, before I give the word to Jeff, I have the same thing we did last time. I want to from start with Chris. Chris, if you can give a like a statement of encouragement because this is being recorded. I have a bunch of students. We have people that are watching on the Instagram and then people on Blackboard. Give a kind of like a, like a statement of encouragement for the students or anybody that's on the on the call on the webinar, please, Chris. Um, I would just reiterate what I said earlier, which is. Um, the, the the profession, the job, the industry is, is super important. I mean, I, I think at times, it, it, you know, it, it kind of gets overlooked. And I, I'm talking from nutrition to performance, to athletic training, to injury prevention, all that. I mean, again, you look at all the way down to youth sports now, there's a lot more of an emphasis on it. But especially, you know, as, as you get into uh, high school and collegiate and obviously professional, um, there isn't any organization or team that's successful without that side and and there's a huge component for impacting and i want to say students kids people i mean i think you know we have a lot of students that may play a sport but want to get into the profession or want to do that one day or the connection they've made while they're in college is with their strength coach or with their athletic trainer or with their nutritionist and so you make a difference in people's lives it's important you're an impact and um you know be be proud of the be proud of the profession you choose and, and just understand that um, you're making a difference in, in people's lives and you're also maybe creating uh you know people that are gonna get into the industry and, and maybe do something great one day. So uh, keep it up and uh you know do do what you gotta do to, to be successful and succeed. Nice, thank you. 
Right. Now, uh, Scott, <laughs> last sentence, statement of encouragement, please. Yeah, so um, for for the students, yeah, if you're if you're interested in evidence based practice research, so I know research classes are typically quite boring or understanding statistics is, you know, frustrating and boring for a lot of people, but I think those are really important classes to consider. And then, yeah, just do whatever you're passionate about and follow those dreams. And I think uh, you can have a, a big role in the world. Um, and uh, yeah, obviously creatine is is something that you should consider. So if you're interested in creatine, feel free to reach out to me or either by email or Instagram. And yeah, I'd be happy to chat further about creatine supplementation. Nice, okay. nice. Before we pass to Jeff, Professor German, want to say something to us, please? Yes, this is one of those times where I say this is why we want to as professionals, um, once we get out into the field to maintain, you know, our nose into what's happening with research and being aware of all of the newer things that are coming out within the field, because there was a time where it was like the only person who should ever take creatine is a bodybuilder. And if you're not a bodybuilder doing immediate energy stuff, why are you taking creatine? Um, and that was like the school of thought for a very, very long time. And here we are, you know, many, many moons later, and it's very much no, every person can incorporate this into their uh, training, into their nutrition, into their recovery. Um, and let's change how we're looking at that this idea of supplementation. So being a forever learner in this field um, is going to be something that will keep you um, in the forefront of what's going on and make sure that as you're working with your clients and your people that um, you know you're staying current with information and not just pulling out like the old dinosaur mentality on something. Nice, thank you. And then last but not least, the boss, the man, Jeff, you're doing a great job as a UDC guy. We're happy. Say something for us, please. Um, the bottom line is that, you know, the world of exercise science, dietetics, you know, those, you know, and there, there's carryover between them plus rehabilitation. There's a lot of carryover. Um, the one thing that we have to understand is that it's so broad that any one thing that you come up with or anything that you can fuel to help somebody will has potential to trickle down to 10,000 other people. So on top of what you guys were all saying about how we need to be staying current with information and guiding our people correctly through science, because I think sometimes we want to go with pro science, which is not science in, in its own self, it's anecdotal, but by taking all of <laughs> By taking all of those aspects, we'll only be able to help you further your career. Um, it'll help me further my career, all of our careers, um, because like you know, we have that ability to make it make a conscious effort to help ten people, but it could it could ten ten you know potentially help tens of thousands of other people unknowingly. So we have that reach, and why can't we use it? And in the words of Napoleon Dynamite, just listen to your heart. That's what I do. Very good. So I think uh, we're done for the day. Uh, thank you, everybody that participated. And it was a good event. Uh, great presenters. And then we hope we do this again. Right. So thank you so much, Jeff. Please, if you can later, that, send us the recording. We're going to put in the social media. Uh, I'm doing actually a live as well on the Instagram. And we're going to do to Kaiser YouTube. So, Chris, one more time. Thank you. I know you're very busy. Yeah, and, thank you. And Professor Scott straight from Canada, everybody that was on the board. Take care, guys. Have a good Bye, have cheers. a good weekend. Have a good long, good long weekend. Ciao. Thank you.